Hey, it's Tariq Ali. A little birdie told me that you wish there was more frequent uploads to help you on your healing journey and that you didn't have to wait months for the next podcast episode. Well, now you don't have to. Check the description to find out how you can leap into healing, the subscriber edition of this podcast where you will get weekly episodes. Yep, you heard me. Weekly episodes. These exclusive subscriber-only episodes will include tools and tangible practices and methods I've come up with to help you heal and grow, reviews of the main show episodes for messages you may have missed, and even more bonus episodes like affirmations, mindset shifts, and Ask Tariq. Check out the description so you can find out more and start leaping into healing today. What's up? It's your boy Tariq Ali and welcome back to That Conversation with Tariq Ali, a podcast where we have the hard conversations that help us grow. <sighs> I am here. I am here. Um, I am here. I am here. I'm so happy to be here. Um before hi how are you (laughs) how are you feeling um how are you doing i hope that you're doing great and if you're not that is perfectly fine make space for your feelings and understand that this too shall pass if you're new to the podcast um i'm a little flustered only because i have not been here in a while (laughs) um for the people who are not new to the podcast hi guys i missed you so much um, and I'm not just saying that as a person who makes like content and comes back like, oh, I missed you guys. But like, I actually, um, I, I, I miss you guys and I miss sharing and I'm finally in a place again where I want to share and I'm going to tell you about the journey it took for me to get here. My last podcast episode was in February, March, one of those, it was, you know, canceled um, episode 11. And, you know, at that time I was in a great space. I had no idea what was to come after. When I say a great space, I mean like I was in a space good enough to get on camera and to make a podcast and to speak up and, and to be loud in my thoughts and beliefs. But I didn't know that I would hit rock bottom right after that. I'm going to take you guys through, you know, what was happening for me during that time and why you are just now getting a podcast today (laughs) a day in august um i have no regrets i am so happy that i took this time for me um and i can't wait to share with you everything that happened so yeah a part of the reason it took me so long to you know do a podcast episode was because if you listen to the past episodes you know I don't just come here to just trigger you and to just tell you a whole bunch of sad stories or to make you feel bad. Um, All of the feelings that I conjure out of you or the feelings that I'm, you know, make you feel on this podcast or the ones that I share that you resonate with. I never like to just bring them up and just let be like, oh, okay, go live your life. (laughs) I want to give tools um, for growth Um, and I want to help you and I want to share what helped me. Um, and it's more so just from speaking from experience and, you know, with everything I was going through, I didn't, I was still figuring it out and I wanted to wait until I was ready to come here and to share and actually not only share, you know, how I did fall and why I wasn't okay, but also what helped me get up and what I knew about that. I didn't want to just tell you. And then months later, it wasn't really fruitful. And so, yeah, I really want to get right into it. Okay. I want to get right into it. So my last podcast episode was canceled, right? And that podcast episode, I don't, I don't <laughs> that episode took a lot out of me to be able to share. Those were words that I've been holding in for years. The cancellation and everything I went through in 2020, you know, just receiving a lot of hate online, like not even talking about what it was actually about. You can go listen to that episode if you really care. It was just the event of itself and receiving that much hate online and just around me and just seeing it affect me in my real life. It it was a lot on me in 2020. And I didn't share too much about it in my last episode because I wanted to get to the conversation that that episode is really about, which was, you know, 
you know, uncovering my unconscious bias and self-hatred. But in 2020, when that happened and, and when I was getting all of that hate online, it's nothing like being online and seeing thousands and hundreds and, you know, just all these different people saying the meanest things about you, you know, getting pictures of your mom. My mom's in a wheelchair, making fun of her disability, like tearing me apart as if I would. I, I just it was a lot. And I'm not, I don't, you know, it was a lot for me and it, you know, it happened the day I moved to LA. A lot of people don't know that, but it did happen the day I moved to LA and I was already dealing with a lot of stress because one, I'm moving across the country to live on my own and to follow my dreams. I went to college to be, you know, a doctor. I had a biology degree and I'm moving to LA to pursue this new industry, YouTube, like creation at the time. This, this is, this is actually the year TikTok was blowing up 2020. So the pandemic also happened. George Floyd also happened. Um, it was a lot of transition shock and it was a lot. It was a lot of stress. It was so much that I was starting to get panic attacks. And I had never experienced panic attacks. I had never exper experienced anxiety in the way that I was at the time. I have never experienced that. Uh, I even had a panic, panic attack while driving and I got in a car accident. And I'm saying all this to say because this is when a lot of my mental health issues started to become very clear. Um, before that, I was, I, I thought I did pretty well. I was fine. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I got diagnosed with ADHD in 2020 when I moved to L.A. And then the stress and everything else I was going through, it made the ADHD worse. And I had anxiety, but I, I, I just was maneuvering it and, and trying different ways to manage it. That time in 2020 was a very traumatic time for me. And it was a very, very low time for me. I was very depressed. It's what got me into my relationship. Well, I was depressed when I met my ex um, and because I was depressed, like I was, you know, I didn't have any boundaries. I was just like completely just looking for someone to be there and for someone to love me. And we were in a pandemic. So that's how that happened. And so going from what was happening in my career and online to now being in an abusive relationship and then all, it, it just, it was a lot, right? Um, and it was a very bad time for me. And over these past three years, I've done a lot of healing. Hence the podcast <laughs> and everything else I've shared over these past three years. Um, if you look at my content, I've done a lot of healing and, you know, I was in a good place. I was like, you know, sharing again. I was doing the podcast. I was posting, you know, my podcast videos on YouTube. Like I wasn't doing YouTube. I wasn't vlogging. But if you listen to the past episodes, you know, this was me you know, trying to get back into it. This was me trying to get back into my flow. Like I was giving myself, showing a lot, my, I was showing myself a lot of grace um, because I, you know, realized how traumatizing that was for me in 2020. So I was just giving myself space and giving myself time. And when it's ready, Tariq, you'll do it. So when February, you know, came around and, you know, I'm experiencing the same thing I experienced in 2020, even though it wasn't, as heavy, right? Like the first time it happened in 2020, I shelled up and I was scared. I was like internalizing everything everyone was saying to me. I was like, well, maybe they're right. Maybe I am a horrible person. Maybe nobody does love me. Maybe nobody wants to hear from me. Like I was believing all of those things. And after three years of like speaking against that word and, you know, telling myself what I believe, Tariq, you're amazing. You're beautiful. You're a great person. You love people. You care about people. You are doing this for the right, like pouring into myself, right? It took me three years to get to a place to be comfortable to share again. And then when I finally got to that place and I have my voice again, right? Like I, I built myself up back to this confidence where I have a voice again and I want my voice to be heard. And once I did that, you know, it, it's like I got the same response or re whatever. Uh, from some people online, like not everybody, but just like online, right? Because over these years, like I've learned um, different ways to manage my anxiety and online and just learning this whole public figure thing. Um, you know, I just knew it was best for me to just not be online. Whenever there's like people tearing you apart, or just like press or whatever, it's just like, don't look at it. Don't be online. Just live your life, right? Like, you know who you are, because the more you read that, the more you start to believe it. 
If you're reading it and thinking about it, you're watering it, you're nurturing it. Whenever people throw judgments and criticism and all these things about you that aren't true, the more you question it and ask people, is this true? Do you think you're watering it? Um, and anything I give my time to, I'm watering, I'm nurturing. I'm, and when you nurture and you water, you're growing it. Um, and so I knew I couldn't, you know, be looking at that. Like I had to be in the world. I had to keep reminding myself. But um, even though I was doing better than the first time, I was still triggered, um, you know, from that time. It, the, you know, it was so recent. It was just three years ago. So when it did happen again, like, yeah, I may not have been having panic attacks while I was driving and getting car accidents and, you know, crying every day like I was before. But I was still anxious. I was still scared. Because of how much work I did over the past three years, there was a huge part of me in me that wanted to prove to myself of the work I had done in the past three years and prove in a way of like, they're not going to get to me. I'm not going to let them get to me. I'm not going to let anyone disconnect me from myself again. I'm going to be me. I'm going to be loud. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep working. And I got very hyper vigilant about being Hey, it's me again. I know you're enjoying the show, but I want to keep it ad-free the way it's been. That's the way it should be. And when you subscribe to this show, you're not only supporting your own healing journey, but you're helping us produce this show so that we can continue healing millions. Check out the description so you can find out how you can leap into healing and subscribe to the show today. Okay, like I'm a healer. And I'm a holistic healer in a way where there's a lot of different ways to heal. I can talk to anyone and listen to anyone and and just find what works the best for them. And so for me, I've learned, you know, in these moments of feeling invalidated, feeling small, feeling scared, all of these things, I had a list of different things that I like I like to do that help me. So like, you know, I love yoga meditation. I was meditating (laughs) in the morning. I would go to the gym every single day, work out for an hour and a half, and then meditate in the steam room after. I would leave there, come home, journal, right? Um, Journaling for like an hour. Then I'll take a walk, walk my dog, check in with myself, talk to myself about the emotions, come home, maybe work for like three hours, a couple hours. And then I would, you know, go to something else, maybe listen to a sermon. And it's like when I drove, I didn't listen to music. I listened to motivational speeches. I listened to, you know, sermons. I just was like putting myself in constant. I was going to acupuncture, girl. (laughs) I was spending hundreds of dollars on acupuncture. I was just, I was doing a lot. And these are things that, yes, they do help. They do help you heal. And these are things that I have used over the years to help me heal in different moments and with different, you know, things. But I was doing all of these things really to make sure that that I thought it was more of a preventative measure. Like I was doing these things so that the hate online wasn't getting to me. I was like, oh, I'm okay right now. So let me just do all these things so that I don't, you know, fall in a hole like I did before. You know, I wasn't getting online. I was just in the world doing these things. And like I've said in past episodes, you know, I've had to take a lot of financial cuts um, because being an influencer um, and making money from my platforms, when I was doing it consistently and all of that, like I made good money. I made really good money, uh, six figures, and I live in a nice place. I live a nice life, you know, uh, (laughs) like Um, My dog, you know, goes to daycare, you know, a three bedroom house. I I do great. I I do pretty good for myself, you know, but influencing and creation and all of this, it takes a lot of time. And I got to a place where I could not, there wasn't enough hours in the day to do all the work that required me to keep up my social media presence and keep the deals rolling in and spend just as much time on my writing to keep that moving. Um, Because I was working on several TV shows that I created. I you know, just just working on so many different things. And, you know, I'm TV is it, it just it's a lot of factors. It's a lot of factors and it's slow. So I had to make a decision. I was like, you know, social media and all of this pays my bills. But like, I'm not happy anymore. Like, this is not 
all for me. This is not all I want to do. And if I spend all of my time doing just this, I won't be able to go to the next thing or the thing I actually want to be spending my time doing. So I had to, you know, write everything down and look at, you know, what I wanted and what I had to give up. And I would have to give up the money that came with being that consistent online. I I knew I wanted to write and I wanted to be in television and film it. And that was the direction I wanted to go in. Right. So I was like, I need to be spending my time doing that. And the time that it took, took a lot of time away from this YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, like all of that. And because I was prioritizing my writing, you know, I would just do social media or, you know, consecration when I could. But now that I was going through all this anxiety and I had got all this hate online, I wasn't doing any social media. I was like, okay, this gives me time to one, focus on my writing. And two, I really just can't be online right now. I'm too sensitive. Um, And so I just stopped posting like that, you know, and because of that, when you stop posting, you're not consistent. You don't get deals, you know, like you're not posting. Um, And so I wasn't making any money. (laughs) Um, And I like I didn't make money for months, like a long time. And I was just running my credit cards up, like just being very honest, just using my liquid assets, like the actual money I had in my accounts only using that money for my rent and like like my bills, like things that I couldn't use a credit card for. Everything else on a credit card, okay? So like, I actually do want to do an, another episode about sacrifices and following your dreams. So I'm not going to go too in depth about that. But the reason I'm sharing this with you is because it got to a point where, you know, I was paying um, for my health insurance and it was like $400 a month. And that was because I could pay it before I had the money and also because it was a good health insurance. But I'm like, I'm young. I barely go to the doctor. Um, And even though this is a tax write off, I don't even need I don't even I can write off something else. Like so I had to switch health insurances in in efforts to, you know, reduce my expenses. So I switched health insurances. And anyone that knows when you switch health insurances, you have to switch your doctor's. Um, and I had to get a new psychiatrist and the new psychiatrist with the health insurance, the new health insurance I got when I went to her, I was only going to her really for my Adderall. You know, I have ADHD. Um, and you know, she was like, Oh, in order to like, you know, get, you know, Adderall, I have to do a test again, like an evaluation. And she was like, not just for ADHD. I have to do an evaluation for everything. And I was like, Oh, okay, cool. I was like, I don't mind. I just, I need my Adderall girl. So, um, (laughs) You know, as we're sitting there, you know, she's, you know, asking me questions about, you know, ADHD and, you know, it's going the way I expected it. You know, I I know the different symptoms and different things that, you know, I had trouble managing before. So, boom. But then when she started to get to the more other questions, you know, she's asking me, you know, uh, do you go out? How often do you go out? I was like, you know, I just I haven't really been going out much. You know, I just been like staying to myself. And she was like, oh, is it? is it something wrong with going out? I was like, no, I, well, I don't really enjoy going out that much, you know? And it's, she was like, do you feel like you avoid going out? And I was like, I don't, I don't think I avoid it. I think I just, I just haven't been feeling it as much lately. She was like, okay, wrote something down, (laughs) moved on to the next question and was like, okay, so what about hobbies? You know, like, what are your hobbies? I was like, well, I'm artistic, you know, I'm creative. I love Anything that, like, I get to create something and come up with something and, you know, it's creative, I love doing it. Um, But lately, you know, like, I bought some, like, paint brushes and some paint recently. And, like, every single time I sit down to, like, paint, I just can't. Like, I don't want to. Um, And so, like, I just keep trying, but, like, I just have not been into it. And she was like, oh, okay. Write something down. And then she's like, okay, so how's your sleep? I was like, you know what? I... I've been like really having trouble sleeping, but like that's not new for me. I've always kind of struggled with sleeping, not always, but ever since college, it's kind of like I'll listen to like, you know, nature sounds and like different things to help me go to sleep. But like my mom has sleeping problems, too. So like I think I just got that from her. She's like, OK, writes it down. Um, and because I studied, you know, biology and psychology in college, the more she was asking me these questions and after each question, I started to scratch my head. Child. I was like, oh, this ain't this ain't sounding too good because I've experienced these things before. As, as, as I started answering these questions, I said, oh, these are the symptoms of <laughs> depression. Um, and, you know, ap- you know, after a while, I just I was answering her questions, but I, I knew where it was going. 
And after the evaluation, she was like, you know, so you do have ADHD, which you knew. Um, and so definitely can sign off on Adderall and all that. But I also, um, you know, evaluate, you know, from what I'm hearing, you're, you know, experiencing severe anxiety and depression. Um, and I shook my head just like this. <laughs> and I was like, I know. I was like, I didn't know until you just asked me those questions. But uh, I just have been thinking about, you know, everything I've been doing. And I love what I do. I love creating. I love, you know, my podcast. I love, I used to love YouTube. I used to love sharing. And it's like, I haven't been loving it much and also even with my writing I've been feeling blocked you know writing wise I haven't been I've been so stuck on my script and I've been trying to figure it out but creatively it just hasn't come to me and I've just been spending a lot of time like journaling and and yoga and, and acupuncture and I'm just realizing that I'm spending so much time doing those things and not really working and when I say working I don't mean in a sense of like you know being productive, I just mean in the way of like doing the things I love. And so, yeah, she was like, you know, I suggest, you know, this medication for anxiety and depression. It's called Zoloft. Um, and, you know, she was like, you know, don't be too alarmed. You know, I have a good amount of celebrity and influencer clients and or patients. I forgot what she said. It's one of those. Um, and, you know, they all take it. And I was like, OK, well, that's comforting. Um, <laughs> like, I'm just <laughs> like, OK, thanks. Um, but yeah, she, and, and at first I, the idea of getting on medication for my anxiety and depression, it was not like, yeah, I was taking Adderall, but Adderall, I feel like, you know, also being a bio student and being in college and seeing people just take it so recreational, I feel like in a way, like, you know, taking Adderall and like it being prescribed, I didn't feel as. I didn't feel shame and I didn't feel stigma. Like I, I, at first I did feel shame around like having ADHD and like not being perfect mentally. And I'm doing air quotes on the camera. And if you can't see, um, <laughs> if you're just listening to the audio, but, um, you know, over the years I've worked on like removing that stigma and shame that I had with ADHD. And I really don't see anything less of myself. If anything, I'm, I'm just happy that I know myself better and ADHD helps me a lot in different moments. So, um, so yeah, uh, it was because of that work that I was able to, in that moment, like, yes, I did have reservations because I did see Adderall a little bit as a productive drug in a way of like, oh, this is going to help me get work done. So I validated it, right? Like, oh, this is going to help me in that realm. So I'm okay. But when it came to anxiety and depression, there was some, there was the stigma um, and the vo- there was a voice inside of me that told me, this is lazy. This is like the medication to me felt like a cop out. It felt like me failing. It felt like me not being able to think positive, to be positive, to be happy, to be joyful. Uh, in a way, I put all of the shame um, on myself. It was kind of like my fault that I wasn't okay. And in a way, I felt like that part of me was also telling me because it was my fault, I didn't deserve help. I had to work on this. I had to fix this. I had to make myself be better. Also had fears of just like, you know, permanently affecting my brain. There was something about the medication that felt like once I take this, I'll never be the same. Like this is going to affect my brain and my brain will be this way for the rest of my life like what if I mess something up or you know what if I cause a glitch like I just it was that it it was it was a lot of stigmas it was a lot of stigmas um and it wasn't until like you know my psychiatrist and my therapist helped me see it in a different way by using an analogy of breaking your leg when you break your leg you get crutches, you get a cast, and it's not permanent. Your leg will heal. But the thing is, you try to alleviate it um, from having to lean on that leg. You want to like give it time to heal and putting le- less pressure on it. 
the crutches and the cast are there to support you while you heal. And when you get to a place where it's healthy again and good for you to walk and to be on that leg again, then you can let go of the support. And you may, you're not going to run and walk as good as you did before breaking that leg. You may never walk the same. You may walk different or you may walk the same. It doesn't matter, but it's going to take some time even after taking that cast off and taking the crutches off. You're going to have to get used to walking again. It's going to take some time. And she said, it's the same with your mental health. And the stigma tells us that, you know, mental health is not the same as everything else in health, right? We throw that mental in the front and there's a whole bunch of different rules, but it's the same thing. My therapist said to me, Tariq, you went through a lot of trauma. She said, let let me list it out for you. You moved across the country alone to start a new career alone. When the pandemic started, you know, George Floyd was just murdered. There was like marches. There was all this racial tension. You were canceled online and being torn apart and, and bullied online by hundreds and thousands of people. You were losing friends in the real world. You went through a domestic violent and abusive relationship She said, Tariq, that's a lot. That's a lot of stress. And, you know, she was like, you studied science. So, you know, like most people, they hear like, oh, stress does this. It makes your hair fall out. It does this. People don't actually believe that stress affects them. They think like, oh, that's just what the doctor's saying so they can get me to take a nap or eat an apple, right? But like, no, she's like, Tariq, you know, that's a lot of trauma. That's a lot of stress on your body and on your brain. And it it was a lot of trauma. And it's going to take some time for you to heal because it was a lot of trauma on your brain. It's just like your leg, just how you need crutches and a cast to help you while you, you heal. This medicine is the same thing. It's your cast and it's your, it's your crutches to help you with your anxiety and your depression as you heal, because it's a lot to wreak and your brain needs help. Your body needs help. It's overwhelmed. And this medicine is not going to cure it. It's not going to, it's going to help you. And when she put it in a way of understanding health holistically in that way, right? Like it's the same, just how you need help and, and support in other ways with your health. Mental health is the same way you need, you need support. You're dealing with anxiety every single day. You're not able to work because of your anxiety and depression. You're avoiding social situations because because of your anxiety and depression. You feel horrible about yourself. You're not able to get out of bed. You're binging. You're doing all of these things because of your anxiety and depression. You need support. It should not take that much work to reek. And this is this is this is a mixture, okay? Like clearly this is me talking to myself as well. This is the <laughs> but it should not take that much work to just be okay. Like it shouldn't take Hours of meditation and yoga and acupuncture and journaling and all of this in one day and a massage. And that's a lot of work just to be okay, not even to be happy, but that's everything you're doing. You're spending hours to manage your anxiety. You need help. You need help. And before I could even get to the medicine, I had to allow myself to be helped. And I had to, by allowing, I mean, I had to know that I deserved help. I deserved support. Because, because of my childhood, you know, what what was the conditioning? Because of my childhood, I was juggled around homes and going place to place for help and for this. And I always felt like a nuisance. I always felt like an obligation to people. I always felt like a, oh, we got, we got to do this for Tariq too. Like, and so I just went into the world. Like if you want it, you got to get it yourself. And, you know, I appreciated help and support, but I didn't feel like I needed it. And I didn't really feel like I deserved it. I felt like that was extra. I felt like if someone supported me, that showed them being a great person. And like, you know, like then I'll pour back, like, I'll just like, it, it was, It was, I didn't think I deserved it. Like, yeah, support from people and support from groups, but like, it's also support in all realms, support from myself, support in this health way. 
I needed help with my anxiety and my depression. Like, yeah, I was, I was proud of myself and I was so prideful because of everything I was doing to be okay with my anxiety and I was managing it, right? And because I'm a healer and I get on this mic and I get in front of this camera and I talk to y'all on, you know, all these platforms about how to deal with your anxiety, how to, you know, manage, I felt so much pride in all of the work I was doing to be okay when really like, yeah, these are good methods. These are things that help. But Tariq, also, it should not take that much work to just be okay. You deserve to be happy. You deserve to be happy. And I had experienced anxiety at this point for so long that I thought anxiety came with life. Hmm. I thought anxiety was a part of it. I thought that like I was do I was just doing the extra work that everybody else wasn't trying to do to be okay. I was like, oh yeah, you're one of the special ones. <laughs> and because of my like privilege and you know, like being able to just like stop working, right? And like working on a new career that's not paying me, um, and running up my credit cards, even if I was going, you know, in debt. Like I still had the privilege and the space to do that, right? And so I'm spending so much time on to just be okay, like spending money on yoga and acupuncture and all these things. And I'm I'm not able to see, like, how can I say? I wasn't able to really see how much time I wasn't actually able to live. A lot of my time was being spent just to manage and cope with everything I was dealing with inside. And most people don't have this privilege. They have to still go to work. They have to still show up to the responsibilities of their life. And it's like the anxiety and depression just builds on top of each other and it gets worse and it gets worse. And it's hard to see that you even need help because you don't even have time to slow down to even do that. Some people don't even have health insurance to go to a psychiatrist and have this evaluation. Like, so I'm, 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 I'm blessed because because of that and this is why I'm so I'm open about it and I want to talk about it was because God blessed me with the resources and the opportunity even if I was going to debt girl I keep saying that <laughs> even if I was because I still was able to go through that and everything I learned in this process it's helped me one grow closer to myself and learn how to take care of myself more and that's why I'm so loud and I share these things because God taught me and is doing great for me but it's not just for me it's for all of you. So, yeah. Um, so, you know, after talking to my therapist and my psychiatrist about it, um, I started the Zoloft and I started at 50 milligrams. And, you know, she told me she was like, it gets worse before it gets better. So when you first start the medication, it makes the anxiety and depression, you know, worse. Um, and it's different for everyone. So I'm really just sharing my experience because I, I, I. I, I just want to share how it was for me, but I want everyone to inquire on their own and, and do their own research. But, you know, of course, I watched a lot of videos before and like saw everybody else's experiences, but I saw everyone. I don't know. Most of the people I did read, like they really, really loved Zoloft and it like changed their life. And they were like, wow, I haven't felt like this in years. And I didn't even know that I didn't feel like this until I do again. Um, because like when you do experience so much anxiety and depression and you live in it consistently, you start thinking that that is just life. You start normalizing anxiety and you think that you're just an anxious person like you. And you can be, but it's like you can also get support for that. The same way that you can take, you know, Adderall to help with your ADHD, you can take something that can help with your anxiety. So it's not as heavy. It's not as, you know, debilitating. Like it, it, you can get something to help you. So the videos made me feel good. I was very optimistic, but I did know that it will get worse before it got better. <laughs> um, and I didn't know what that looked like, but that first two weeks of, uh, the first week, but the first two weeks of taking Zoloft was, <sighs> boy, that was the scariest time of my life. And the reason it was so scary is because I, I, I've never felt that much anxiety and depression in my life. Um, you know that picture of like Summer Walker when she's like on the red carpet and she's like got her arms to her side and like she's standing weird and people are like, yo, ain't nobody got that much social anxiety. Like, why are you standing right like that? Like, this is just all a fake. Getting on Zoloft that first week and because it makes your anxiety worse, 
I understood that picture so much. I just woke up with so much fear, <laughs> with so much fear, so much anxiety, so much like uncertainty, like, and, and, and just so much fear in a way where, you know, before Zolov, like, you know, something would happen and I got anxious or like, I would get anxious in front of the camera. I would get anxious in public like when people looked at me. Like, I knew the different things that got me anxious. But that first week of Zolov, it, it kind of like, opened every door of anxiety and it was just there like for no reason and I would wake up just like I would just feel restless like my body was kind of vibrating like I wasn't grounded um my head felt a little tight I could just like in a way I just felt chemical reactions happening in my head I don't know how to explain it that sounds extreme. I'm just being, ex I just want to be extremely honest. At this time also, and this was not planned, my entire family came to LA the week I started Zoloft. <laughs> and they had planned that trip for months. And I didn't know I was going to be on Zoloft. I didn't even know I was depressed or anxious the week before. So, but I wanted to start immediately because, you know, it was just going to get worse because once I did learned that I was anxious and depressed, like in this, in the, you know, session with my psychiatrist, I actually started to feel it. It's kind of like when you first start owning something and like you actually start feeling it. Like I started, even before taking the medicine, I was, I felt more depressed and anxious because I knew it was there and I was accepting it. And so, you know, I just started it immediately and my family came to town the day of. <laughs> and when I say my family, I mean my dad, my stepmom, my aunt, my uncle, and my grandma and my granddad. So we had a full house. Like, I have three bedrooms, so it was two in every room and I was sleeping on the couch. Um, and I didn't want to tell them about the medicine because I didn't want to... One, my family is like Southern and just, you know, they're older. They, they you know, black people, you know... Just think so differently about medicine and mental health. And, and though I knew they would have put the work in to like try to understand it, I just didn't want to make them worry. I kind of wanted to just go through this alone. Um, not alone, but I, I kind of just wanted to deal with it alone. Um, and, and you see how that speaks to earlier what I was saying, right? Like me not thinking I deserved support, right? Because I, I, I felt like I had to deal with this alone. Um, but they were here and, you know, it, it was so bad where they noticed, they noticed, um, you know, my stepmom noticed first. She was like, you okay? She just like, just looked at me throughout the day and I'm a very happy, joyful, y'all know me. So I'm just a happy person. And, and she, my face was so heavy. Um, and I would just look and just blink space, um, and she just realized and she was like, you OK? And I told her because I, I just wanted to feel some type of support. I just wanted to feel not alone in it. I hated that I was kind of walking around with the secret and I just wanted someone to know. But the thing is, every day it was getting worse. It just felt like every day I woke up with more anxiety and more anxiety the first week. It just was like insane and it was like so bad at a point where I couldn't sleep I would lay down trying to sleep and just scared of everything like is my writing good am I good enough does my family really love me are they here for the right reasons like every worry <laughs> just like was in my head things that I wasn't really worrying about before taking the Zoloft it just like it felt like the Zoloft was giving it energy and giving it power and it was yelling in my head just so much fear and I would I just like sat up and yelled to God like God please give me my brain back like please give me me back I want to be me again I want my brain and you know I pride myself in how I'm able to articulate how intelligent I am you know my mind and for the first time in my life like I've gone through so much and like dealt with so many external you know things and also internal like self-hatred but I've never I've never not had my mind in this way. And it scared me more than anything. It scared me more than anything. I was like, what if this never ends? <laughs> what if this is what the rest of my life will be like? I was so scared. It got so bad to a point where I couldn't hide it anymore. Like I told my aunt and I told my dad and it, 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 I'm so happy I did because one, they were just noticing that I was acting weird. <laughs> they were like, 
they know me. So they were just like, Tariq is acting weird. And so I just told him and they was like, oh, okay. And, you know, my dad has, you know, I've done a video with my dad on my YouTube channel. Yes, coming out to him. But the video right after that is about mental health because my dad has his fair share of, you know, um, challenges with mental health over the years and all his life um, with bipolar um, schizophrenia, like, um, you know, uh, ADHD, like just different stuff. Um, and so it felt really good. And I didn't even, I didn't even think about it, but it just felt so good to be able to share with him what I was going through and him like understand, like, hmm, it, it makes me smile because I didn't think I would ever be understood in that way. Like my ADHD, like I know every everybody now these days got ADHD, girl. But like it's it's been it it's been a journey for me over these past three years, and I just accepted. I I got to a point of accepting that no one will ever get it, other than like other ADHD people, um, and like I'm okay with that. Um, I don't really need people to get it, um, but I just could have never imagined being understood in this way from my dad. And it was such a big deal that my dad was here. Like, yes, that video of me and my dad is the biggest on my channel, me coming out to him. But, you know, as you heard in the video, me and my dad did not have the close relationship. And this, him coming to LA, and they spent like 10 days here. That was the most time I spent with my dad in over 10 years. Like, our relationship had been strained um, for multiple different reasons that I'll get into in another episode. But, you know, I just want to stay on the, you know, anxiety and depression. But it just, it felt good to be going through all of that. I remember I was in my bathroom and the same day we were having a cookout because I told them I wanted to have a cookout in my house with all of my friends. And I was spending a lot of time in my bathroom and my dad came in there because he was calling my name. And he was like, Tariq, you Okay. And I opened the door and I was crying. He was like, boy, I also was filming an interview for a documentary that day. And so all of my family thought I was nervous about the, the interview and the documentary, which I was not. I was just anxious. So the medicine was making me nervous and anxious for the interview. But I, I normally would not have been nervous at all. Um, but I was really scared. I couldn't find anything to wear. Um, and that was just my anxiety. Um, but my dad opened the door and he saw me crying. And he said, Tariq, boy, I know you're not nervous about that interview. I said, no, this is actually when I did tell him. I was like, no, it's, I started taking Zoloft and it's, it's making me so anxious. Like it's an anxiety and depression medicine. He was like, I know what it is. He said, he said, it takes a little while to get used to. So I get it. Just take your time. Okay. Just know it will pass. Like giving me advice from experience. Like, and I, I didn't, it really healed me. It really healed me because I felt not only seen, but I felt supported by my dad. And that was something that my inner child really needed. Um, and so, yeah, that, and I'm so happy because, you know, God works in mysterious ways because like there was a reason they came that week. And there was a reason God pulled me to go to that psychiatrist that same week because I needed my family here. And even though it was very uncomfortable having them here because being so anxious and depressed, like I felt like I had to pretend and perform every single day. I was like, oh, my gosh, I wish I weren't here so I could just be sad. But at the same time, going through so much depression and anxiety. I'm happy they were here because they forced I'm air quoting, but forced me to try every single day. Something I learned about depression is like. When you when you do try to get out of it, you it's not going to feel good. <laughs> You're not going to want to do it. It's not going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm enjoying this. Like you have to just keep trying and keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. And you're going to still feel depressed. You're going to still be anxious. Like you have to do it with it. And you have and, and them being here and waking up every day and cooking breakfast and cooking, like doing all of the things that I like fills me up, like what I love about myself and my family it encouraged me every day to get up and try and just keep trying. And when I wasn't okay, what I loved, my family has grown so much. Like, they allowed me to not be okay. Like, they would, you know, like, they knew I wasn't okay. And 
they would just like try to talk to me. But like if I wasn't given too much, like they would lay off. Like they were allowing me to just not be the most happiest person and not the most joyous person. And I needed that because while they gave me space, they also gently motivated me to keep trying to read. Keep trying. And I'm so happy they were here. And by the time they left, I was starting to feel a little better with the Zoloft. But during this time, like I said, the Zoloft made the anxiety and depression a thousand times worse for me. Um, And though it was a horrible experience, (laughs) um, because of how I am and who I am, um, and also just in this journey and, you know, being a healer, I know the only way to really heal and to learn and to grow is to become curious of yourself instead of judgmental. So, you know, during this time, I was just paying a lot of attention to what anxiety felt like. What were those thoughts? What were those fears? Um, And I just was writing them down um, because I knew something I knew about my anxiety is like in the moment, I believe these things and like all these fears would come up. And then like when I'm okay, like when the anxiety passed, I'm like, I'm not even scared of that. So Something that I felt like would help me is if, okay, what about when it does happen? Let me write down these things that's scaring me. And then when I'm okay, I can see like what the anxiety is, like what the anxiety is telling me, like behind those fears, right? So during that week where I was extremely anxious in the first week of Zoloft, I made sure to document it also to see what the medicine was doing to me, how I was reacting to it, was my appetite off, like really paying attention to me and my body and my health. And so I wrote down what the anxiety was saying to me. And because of this, it has helped me to really see my anxiety objectively. Um, And when I say objectively in a way of like, now when certain thoughts come up or certain fears come up, I'm like, oh, that's just anxiety. It's inside of me. I'm experiencing it, but it's not who I am. Anxiety is just, you know, here to, you know, keep you from something, to keep you safe. There's a lot of different reasons your brain and, you know, anxiety comes up. But being able to identify the anxiety would help me so that when it did come forth in the future, I'd be like, oh, hey, anxiety, what's up? And like, I I will know how to deal with it. Um, And so let me get to this journal entry. Let me see. Okay, so this is April 11th, uh, 2023. I've been on the anxiety, depression, Zoloft medication for about three weeks now, and I can definitely feel, see them working and helping me out. The same things that gave me anxiety before give me anxiety now. It isn't a cure, but the intensity of the anxiety is way less. And because I know and have practices that help me with my anxiety when they come up, I am able to properly hold and respond to them versus reacting and spiraling. Because I did this alone for so long, I can actually feel the support and the assistance of the medicine. I can feel it actually helping me. And I'm so grateful for it. It makes my days brighter, longer, and more fulfilling. I spent so much of my days before in constant thought, worrying, and fear. Every second was a fight to stand tall. And now I feel like I'm getting my balance back. Like I'm learning to stand up tall again without having to fight as hard. I'm so blessed because this entire experience has changed my view on being strong, anxiety, and receiving help. I've been getting the message of opening myself up to receiving help and not having to do everything alone. And this message came from God, of course, and my guides, but I thought it was exclusive to people. I thought he was just saying that I was able to get support from people and I should be more open to it. But little did I know, God said in all realms, strength is not killing yourself or pushing yourself past your limits just to say you did it on your own. It's doing the best you can while taking care of yourself and getting help when you need it. Acknowledging your weaknesses and shortcomings and getting help for them is strength because you have to push past the ego and pride and perception and stigma and choose your well-being because your well-being is what is needed for you to fulfill your purpose and anointing. Listen to your body, know your limits, and get help when you reach a limit. Limits don't mean stop. They mean get help. Something I've learned about my anxiety is it needs to know every detail, every possibility. It wants to control every situation. It anticipates failure, chaos, and turmoil. It questions every decision I've made and haven't made yet. 
It calculates the risk of failure and pain of every incident. It shows me the worst case scenarios. It tries to hang on to everything that's here, even when not needed or healthy. It's always trying to improve me. It criticizes and critiques everything I do. It worries about how I look, sound, and are perceived by others. It takes me out of the present and feels safe as hidden, quiet, and playing it safe. It always fears missing the bus. So that was really me just free writing about like what anxiety was inside of me, right? But this was physically. So physically, my chest feels tight. My muscles tense up. I hold my breath. I feel like my body is vibrating or like a constant moving, even when I'm still. It's like a restless feeling. Um, I feel like I'm not of the world. I feel like I'm in my head and I'm not present. Um, I struggle to make eye contact and my eyes wander a lot. Um, and so I was, you know, even though it wasn't the best experience because, you know, it was such an extreme side of my anxiety and depression, I was able to really just experience and feel and see what that looked like. And it it had never been that clear to me before. Um, like the fear would be so loud in my head and I'd be like, oh my gosh, that's a fear inside of me. So I would just write that down as like, that's the anxiety. Um, because like when the medicine did start working and these fears weren't there, I was like, oh, that was the anxiety. And so, like I said, the medicine isn't a cure. It's like a crutch or like a cast. It is support is here to help. So say, let's give an example. If the anxiety was at a 10, the medicine would bring it down to a five and you have to do the rest of the work. Now, that's not an actual percentage number. Don't quote. OK, that's just I'm just giving you an example. OK, it's a partnership. You're working. It's supporting you. You have to still do the work to learn different ways to manage your anxiety. And so I was blessed because I've been doing that for the past three years um, with like yoga, meditation, and all that. So when I was using the medicine and it started kicking in and after three weeks, three it was amazing. I was like, girl, I'll pop these things like Tic Tacs, girl. Because, <laughs> girl, I was waking up every day and I was excited about the day. You know, things would bother me, but like, or like the same things that gave me anxiety before, they would come, but it would pass. Like it would, it would go away like in five minutes or two seconds or whatever. Before, it would kind of just stay in my head. And I would loop it and I would think of different ways to approach it, different ways to think about it, different ways to dissect it. I would, it's like constant thought. And and that is anxiety, like being in your head. You start shaking because it's like so much going on. You have to still be in the day, but you're still trying to get these thoughts together. You're worrying about this. It's all of that, right? But with the medicine, I was able to, the anxiety was able to come. And because of meditation and also learning in meditation to let thoughts pass and also meditation and breathing, just all these different methods with the things that I do, I was able to experience the anxiety, do the method and like literally continue on with my life. And that's the anxiety side of it, right? Like I was able to move on and, do, you know, go back to my life. The depression side of it is like, I was actually interested to do the things that I actually am interested to do, <laughs> like writing um, and, and like you know, creating, like I was able to do those things again. It was, I was just experiencing happiness and a life without severe anxiety and depression. And I didn't realize how long I had gone without feeling like that. Um, And it, it just made me so sad also in a way of like, wow, there's so many people that's probably living with so much anxiety and depression and they have no idea and they're struggling. And, and you know, I just saw how, exi- how anxiety got converted into so many different things. Like, you know, my vices when I'm really anxious and, and that first week of the Zoloft and even before when I was depressed, like, I know my vices. I know my ways that I cope um, when I'm not okay or, you know, and I've talked about it in past episodes. So one of them is, you know, you know, binge eating. So I, you know, developed an eating disorder when I was younger and I'm way better with it now. But like due to all of the stress and trauma I've been experiencing, when I do get in the, whenever I do have those bad feelings, right, or the anxiety comes in, um, you know, I binge eat and, you know, I binge eat and I eat a lot and I eat, you know, a lot of food, like a lot of food. Um, and I just keep eating because I, eating makes me feel good. Um, and even if I'm full, even if I feel sick, I'll just keep eating because 
eating makes me feel good. So that's one. Um, also, drinking and just smoking. And, and it was more so like when I got to the root of like why, it really was just like a being sober and experiencing that anxiety and that depression was just a lot to hold. It was heavy. Um, and, you know, being high made me giggly or made me, you know, a little woozy or what it just it helped me have a different experience um and i realized that you know these the, you know substance abuse and like you know liquor and weed like it helped me it took me out of those emotions and those and the experience not even just the emotion because i even if i was still sad high it was a different experience when i was sober it was just there it was just present it was heavy when you when I had something else in the equation, it was like, yeah, it was there, but I also could laugh because I was high or I also could like, you know, dance or do this because I was drunk. Like that was what I was going to that for. And then also like sex, honestly, like I was having a lot of sex um, and I, I don't have that much sex. Like, I'm, you know, <laughs> I the crazy thing is. I was having so much sex and I was enjoying it. So I didn't feel like, oh, this can't be, you know, the depression. But I also knew like I'm always learning something new about myself, especially I'm 25. I'm young and we're always changing no matter what age you are. We're always changing if you allow yourself to change. Um, And I've also gone grown so comfortable in my sexuality and in my gender expression and just all of that. So, you know, I've allowed myself more sexual freedoms and, you know, liberties and and exploration than I did before, because there's a lot of shame that, you know, especially as a queer person that we place on ourselves because of our sexuality. We already feel disgusting because the world tells us we are. And so when it comes to sex, we are, you know, whatever. We can get into that conversation another day. (laughs) But when I got diagnosed with anxiety and depression and I started feeling it, I wanted to just let myself be depressed. Like I was not trying to be positive. I was just like, I was giving myself space to literally not be okay. And I didn't realize that I wasn't completely doing that before. Like, yeah, I would let myself like think certain things, but I would like fight it with a sermon, fight it with yoga, fight it with this. And it's like, I wanted to just allow myself to be not okay. And there not be a solution. There not be a plan. Like just allowing myself to just exist and not be okay. And I never, I didn't realize that I didn't allow myself to do that. Because before I would, you know, not be okay and use that to fuel my productivity. And then when I wasn't doing that, when I got into my healing journey, I was like feeling these things and then like responding with ways to like heal myself and take care of myself. But I did, I, I wanted to get to, I wanted to allow myself to just not be okay. And to not know and to not be perfect and to not be whatever. Like I have been so perfect. And when I say, I mean like the intention of being a perfectionist and being perfect all my life, it was my survival. Not only being a queer person, but also just being juggled around homes. Like I had to be something. And so especially also like, you know, who I am online and in my career, I just always put this pressure on myself to like be, to be better and to figure it out and to just you know and I just wanted to not be anything great (laughs) like I just really wanted to allow myself to just live and so I was having a lot of sex and I allowed myself the space to do that because like I just said I was allowing myself to just exist like no judgments like you're not having too much sex you're just having sex you're living your life you're not okay you're depressed whatever right just allowing myself to live but I did realize that it was rooted in something else. One, because like I said, I don't have that much, like I'm just, I don't have that much sex as much as I was having at this time, but it was starting to become manic. I did know before that I went to men and guys and sex for validation when I needed it and in different moments of depression. But because I also wasn't online, when I wasn't going to eating and when I wasn't going to like smoking or drinking, you know, I was on like, all these dating apps and like jacked and grinder, like it was freaking Twitter. Like it was just like a constant looking and looking and looking and just wanting the experience. Um, and so these were my vices and it, it was just like, it became very manic at a, 
like like that like that was the mania like i was just on it all day looking for the next person talking to the next person meeting up with people like it it was it, i have never experienced that and you know sharing it with my therapist you know she was like you know let's just become aware of it like you know there is mania that comes up when you get in this you know deep depression like and she was explaining to me cuz i was like i've never gone through this like i've never gone through this and she was like you know depression is different every time. Like it shows up different. And, and, you know, if you did get out of it before, it usually comes back a little harder. And so like, it, it was a little alarming for me because I did not recognize myself. I did not recognize myself. Not only did I not recognize myself, but I didn't have my brain. And I, I just, I was, I felt horrible y'all. I was going through a really bad time. And if you really pay attention to these different vices and things that I'm going to you realize that it's not even the thing that I'm going to. It's it's the need that I'm going to. Like, I wanted to feel something other than what was there. If I just sat in this chair and if I was sober, which was all of that anxiety, that depression, I was going to these things to have a different experience. I was eating to feel better. I was, you know, going to... Um, you know, smoking and drinking to just have a different experience and to feel joy and laughter or looseness or just to feel something different. And with the men and the sex, I was, this was the first time I was going to feel something physical, but also the validation of like being wanted and sex and like, it's the feeling. Um, and this is why I say feeling controls everything. <laughs> um, and it, it, it's, it's, you know, they don't, they can, let's be clear. They can control everything. And it's during, I'm so happy I went through this process because sometimes you have to hit rock bottom and you have to go through this process to learn how those emotions are controlling you and what you're doing to remedy or cope with those emotions. Um, and those things you're going to, what are they giving you? What are, what are you receiving that those emotions need? And so, you know, after the couple of weeks of doing the Zoloft, I started realizing how you know, these things would let up. Like I didn't have the impulse to smoke. I didn't have the impulse to like go on jacked or like meet up with people and have sex. Like I, it just wasn't there. I was spending all of my time on the phone with my family and talking to my best friends and like writing and like having fun. And like, I was less agitated by Grath, my dog. Like it's just, I, I saw a life without not without anxiety, but you get what I mean, like where anxiety and depression wasn't prevalent, right? Um, but that was on 50 milligrams. And so that I would experience that, like I would have great days, right? And I would, you know, pay attention to my days. And I would have a great day Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and say Thursday, I have this impulse to like, you know, maybe I don't feel, I don't feel horrible, but I just like have this impulse to smoke or I have this impulse to download Jack and like I go have sex. It was like, I'll have relapses you could say that right like relapses every four three four days so like twice a week right and you know I thought I just had to put more work into like you know making sure that my anxiety and depression was under con control like I still thought that this was like my fight but when I shared this with my psychiatrist and therapist you know they were saying how you know if you up your dosage it will be more consistent um and I noticed in that moment that I still had some stigma to fight because in a way I felt like, okay, I'm already getting help. Like, don't be greedy. It's kind of like if you ask somebody for $50 and it's like, okay, you, I'm already giving you $50, girl. I'm not going to give you a hundred. Right. So it was like, I was putting shame on myself. Like, oh, you're not working hard enough. Like you already on the medication to reek. Like you already getting help and now you need more help. Like I was shaming myself for needing the more help and, and just looking at dosages as the more you go up, the less capable you are. When really also being a scientist, I understand that like, it's like a puzzle, like it's numbers, but don't get confused on the numbers. Think of it like a puzzle. Like if your brain is a square, 50 milligrams, may be a triangle and 75 milligrams may, may be a circle, but a hundred milligrams may be a square. And those work together, right? It's like, what works best with your brain? Like, don't look at the numbers and think you're less of this or more messed up because you have a high, like, look at it as this is what works best with me. Okay. And I had to look at it in that way because I was starting to look at it in a way of like, the more you go up, the less capable you are, the less effort you're putting in, 
the less valuable you are. Like I was putting all of that shame on me, but because I was able to identify that shame, I was like, oh, wow. Like this is that, that voice inside of me. Like when she told me to go up in, in the medication, it's kind of like that, like it comes up, right? Like we feel it in us. Like, mm, like that hesitation, say out loud what is happening inside of you. And like I said, like, wow, I feel like shame. Like, I feel like I'm being lazy. Like I'm not doing all I can to be okay. And I realized that that was shame that I was putting on myself. And that was from the stigma. And so because I was able to identify it and understand like, oh, that's just shame and the stigma. That's not what you believe. Like you want to believe like you deserve to help and you deserve this to reek. You deserve, deserve support. And so because of that, I was able to say, you know what? I'll try to go up. So I did go up to 75 um, and then the relapses got to like once a week and then I went up to 100 and then like, boom, I'm great. Um, and so that's been my journey. So now I take <laughs> 100 milligrams of Zoloft and I'm also on 30 milligrams of Adderall slow release. And I really wanted to share this because this is one of, I'm, I'm, I, this is one of my proudest moments of my life. I'm so happy that I went through this and I'm so happy I allowed myself to receive this help because I'm able to be here again. I'm able to be in the world again. I'm able to feel the love from my friends. I'm able to feel the love from my family. I'm able to feel the love from myself. I'm able to respect myself, my boundaries. I'm able to, I'm just able, I'm just able to live. And I needed to hit rock bottom to, to get here. I needed the assistance. I needed to heal that inner child and to tell them that you deserve help. You deserve support. You can have support. You don't have to do everything alone. I needed to go through all of this and I needed this time to myself. I wanted to come and share this because I feel on top of the world. I am on top of the world, but I am on top of the world with the help and assistance um, of, you know, Zoloft right now. And that is okay. And if you need help, please seek help. Like you should not have to do this all alone. You deserve help. You deserve support. And in any way that looks, you know, it could be a friend right now. It could be a therapist. Then it could be Zoloft. It could be medic. It, it, you deserve it. If it will help you, don't worry about what it looks like and what other people think. Do what you need to wake up every day and to be with you and to show up to the things you care about. We normalize so much anxiety and depression in our lives that we don't ever actually get to live because we're spending so much time trying to avoid emotions and the anxiety. And I'm telling you, the moment you allow yourself to be helped and get support is the moment you will actually start being able to live and to show up to who you actually are, your true self. And I want to really push that in all communities, but especially in my black community, because this is something that we don't support or it is something that needs to be talked about. And yeah, the goal isn't really to stay on Zoloft for the rest of my life, but the goal isn't to get off of Zoloft as quick as possible. I, I am always just about looking at where I am right now. I live life in seasons. Nothing is permanent. Nothing is forever. This season is, I'm in the season right now where I need Zoloft. And if I get to a season later where I feel like I don't, I will work on getting off of it. Like it's not, it doesn't have to be a permanent thing. I feel like that is something that most people are afraid of, but it's about looking at where you are now, accepting where you are now, looking at where your downfalls are, your shortcomings, or where you need help and support, and seeking help and support because you deserve that help and support. You deserve that help and support. You deserve help and support. And I want you to repeat that to yourself whenever you feel afraid of asking for help or assistance or just anything. You deserve support and help and love, okay? Yeah, so my name is Tariq Ali. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, and we're going to keep doing it, man. I will be back and we will keep having those hard conversations that help us grow. And I love you. And I thank you for being so patient and understanding. And I send a million hugs and a million kisses. And yeah, I love you. And I'll see you next time. 
¿Qué, qué? Hey, it's Tariq Ali. A little birdie told me that you wish there was more frequent uploads to help you in your healing journey and that you didn't have to wait months for the next podcast episode. Well, now you don't have to. Check the description to find out how you can leap into healing, the subscriber edition of this podcast where you will get weekly episodes. Yep, you heard me. Weekly episodes. These exclusive subscriber-only episodes will include tools and tangible practices and methods I've come up with to help you heal and grow, reviews of the main show episodes for messages you may have missed, and even more bonus episodes like affirmations, mindset shifts, and Ask Tariq. Check out the description so you can find out more and start leaping into healing today.